Well, hello everyone and welcome to Serial Week Conversations presented by IHS Market. My name is Paul Markwell, uh, host for this session, and today we're talking about the upstream business and uh, really questioning how can it prosper going forward. And joining me today on the panel, we're fortunate, I think, to have a great body of expertise and knowledge uh, really spanning uh, different parts of the upstream community. Um, first, let me introduce Thomas, Thomas Garcia Blanca, Executive Managing Director of uh, at Repsol in Spain. Hi, hi Thomas. Hi, Paul. How are you doing? Uh, and also, we have uh, Tim, Tim Perry, Managing Director, Global Co head of Oil and Gas at Credit Suisse. Hi, Tim. Good morning. And uh, Adif, Adif Zalkifli, Executive Vice President and CEO Upstream at Petronas. Hi, hi, Adif. Hello, Paul. Hello, everyone. So the exam question today, which I know the panel are going to be able to uh, uh, discuss, is really what's the case for upstream uh, from an investment point of view, from a stakeholder point of view? What, how will it proceed and be prosperous and successful? We know it's a resilient sector. Um, I'm hoping that we can talk a bit about ways, the yeah, positive things we can see from the industry. Um, so maybe what we could do, maybe start a little more generally, maybe uh, each of you could share your perspectives on where you see um, the upstream in terms of the current environment. What does the current environment mean? And then we'll get a little bit further into the resilience and the, the things that the sector players can actually do. And then finally, what, what the sector can offer, let's say, going forward to investors. So Adif, if I could, if maybe I could start with you. Uh, so really, in terms of your perspectives, you know, on where upstream sits in this world, as, as I've described, energy transition, post-COVID, um, how do you think it sits in the energy mix? And I know you've got a broad-based uh, portfolio, so you must feel... I think, first of all, we must accept that energy transition is real. It's, it's going to happen. It's just a matter of time. And, uh, and the... Uh, those who have been pro, uh, pro, pro pushing for renewables has made a lot of great strides um, in terms of lowering their cost and in terms of technology development as well. But then again, you know, the reality is the world will be in need of, the, of energy. There will be about 50% increase of energy between now to 2050. And we all believe that as much as uh, there are a lot of push for renewable, there will be a space for oil and gas. Yes, no doubt renewable will be perhaps a uh, double in terms of its energy mix, share of its energy mix, but there will be a space for oil and gas, and especially for gas. And for companies like Petronas, I think we are a lot more gas than oil. We are, our portfolio is about 70%. And it is well acknowledged that uh, gas is among, is, is one of, is the cleanest effect uh, of the, uh, all the three fossil fuels that we have. So there will be a lot more focus on gas going forward. And uh, for Petronas, I think we are quite well set up uh, to be in the gas business. Uh, we have been in gas business for the last 40 years, and then uh, we have got quite a big gas portfolio. Uh, our gas business not only extends from upstream, but also into midstream, and also we do have uh, access to uh, our traditional markets in the uh, uh, Japan, Korea, China, and we'll continue to do that uh, for, for Petronas. And I think what the most important uh, we need to uh, accept is that there will be competition among all these choices of energy. Renewable has got a certain uh, attraction. Oil, oil, for that matter, gas, has its own set of attractions. It is affordable today. It is accessible. And you know you can actually transport gas to any parts of the world today. And there's abundance of, uh, abundance of gas. And uh, for me, I think that's where uh, the focus will be for a company like Petronas. And uh, we, will show, we will certainly change on our portfolio mix. Uh, we also will invest a bit more into renewable, but gas will continue our main uh, bread and butter going forward. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so interesting. So you've got that. You've got an option to switch a bit into gas. I think we'll come back to the portfolio points uh, shortly. Um, but just Thomas, maybe uh, maybe you could comment just in the broad the gen general context again. I'm quite interested in. I noticed that companies are um, in some cases, you know, rethinking. Uh, longer-term price expectations. I wonder if you have a, a sense of, of of what the current environment means for the longer term. Whoa, Paul, you are starting with the easiest one. Uh, I would say that what, what their forecast 
I, I will dare just to make it, it will be wrong, definitely. Uh, I would say that consensus based on balance between demand and supply with detailed analysis and so on, so it's a science, but let's be honest, never works. Always an unexpected disruption happens and here we are. So say that uh, I, I'm more oriented just to define your business based on, on, on break-evens. Um, because sometimes uh, uh, if you base your business in low prices, you may lose opportunities. But uh, obviously you will be out of the list of the companies in Chapter 11. So considering that, it seems that there is a consensus in the industry that there are enough resources of oil uh, for the next 15, 20 years, yes, with break even below $60. That's, 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 that's a fact, that's, that's a, a number. Also for gas, there is a kind of consensus that I'm um, talking about Henry Half in the, in the, in the Americas, uh, below $3, there are enough resources just to drive a lot of gas and to cope with the, with the needs. If you put on top of those $3, the, the other cost for LNG, you could have a, a kind of reflection. So that's, that's to me my, my, my first approach uh, to what we could see in the, in, the, in the future. There are other, let's say, pricing, as, as for example, how we're going to price the, the, the CO2 emissions. And to me, that's pure gazing. Meanwhile, we don't have, an, an, let's say, a consensus in the, in the international community about how to solve the emissions problem. Uh, putting price to the CO2 in the future is, is pure gazing. So that's my, my, my perception of what might happen. Um, and I, again, I'm going to make the disclaimer that this perception for sure is going to be wrong uh, with whatever extra this lecture. Well, I think you've, I think you've uh, described some of the uncertainties there anyway, uh, Thomas, especially on CO2 price and so on. Tim, I'm interested, um, your perspective really coming at it from, if, you, if I could say, representing the, the sort of finance community and, you know, what's, what do you think has changed now as a result of current environments in terms of how investors or or your sector in general think about this business? Well, sure. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, the world has changed. Um, for a very long time, if you looked at E&P companies, they were really valued on Wall Street primarily uh, as a driver of NAV per share, net asset value per share. And net asset value per share, of course, was being developed through drilling and therefore, the faster you drilled, the more NAV you created and the greater NAV per share. This was a maxim or a strategy then that really you outspent cash flow. The unfortunate part of that is that led to uh, too much production, too fast, and then as a resulting of a reduction or even collapse in, in, in prices. Where Wall Street has moved over the last few years, and increasingly so, and very much so over the last two to three years, is the key driver of valuation is not NAV per share, but really looking at free cash flow per share. And that's free cash flow, so that's after uh, all operating expenses, and it's also after capital expenditure. So therefore, you really, rather than outspending your cash flow, you're staying within cash flow. This results into a slower growth, a slower production. And we saw many companies half a decade ago growing at 15, 20, even greater than 20%. I think most companies now are targeting growth rates of single digits, uh, and in many cases, mid single digits and uh, this is really what Wall Street wants to do. And by looking at free cash flow um, yields, that's really how they're looking at the general S&P 500. The general S&P 500 trades at around about 6% free cash flow um, yield. And so Wall Street's really looking for that yield to be higher than 6% because they perceive that EMP is a more volatile industry due to the commodity mix. So it's really had a significant change in how boards and management teams run their companies. 
Yeah, that's, that, that really is a shift in if within cash flow is a free cash flow, of course, is a, is a major shift. Well, that's very interesting. So I think we painted a picture of the the market in a sense. Um, maybe we could get into a bit more specific and um, think about, so what can oil companies, what can upstream companies actually do to to change, you know, to, to be more competitive in this environment? Maybe a start with Thomas. I know Thomas, thinking about it, maybe you, you've got a, a portfolio which is fairly broad, I would say. You've had recent exploration successes. You've got, you know, quite active in a way in m and how, how do you think uh, the portfolios perhaps can contribute to competitiveness as going forward? Of course, Paul, uh, I will say that the adequate balance is the key. Uh, I used to say that putting all the action in the same basket could be risky. You could be the best on a subject in a country, a very focused player, but if for whatever reason your activity is banned or you lose the license to operate, uh, you are out of business. I guess focus is good to be more competitive using your knowledge, but the adequate level of diversification is, is a virtue as well. Since being good in all the disciplines is almost impossible, I guess being in the proper assets with the proper partners helps to balance your portfolio. And I'm going to give you some examples about our own portfolio that, that as you mentioned, is quite diversified. We are very competitive in unconventionals, in gas fields, in complicated environments. So we have been demonstrating, we have been able just to turn around mature assets in onshore and shore water, arrange solutions with governments in complicated situations. But for example, we, we are not operating in deep water. We are in the right uh, asset with the right partners. That way, we're involved in almost any kind of activity, but the big LNG pro projects. Uh, again, personally, I will put all my money, and my personal money in one sector in one country. This is what I mean. So I guess after this speech, I will say that uh, spread your risk and whatever you do, do it very well yourself or with the proper partners. Yeah, so be selective, spread, but be selective. Uh, I think that's, that's the it, that's message. That's it. That's it. So that's a, that's a portfolio um, element. Um, Tim, maybe maybe you could comment on this, uh, looking at it maybe from I, I don't know maybe from a sector as a whole. How, what do you think the sector can do to be more competitive? I'm thinking about M and A and consolidation and what what sort of role that that plays in this. Sure. Well, thank you, Paul. First of all, we do think over time there will be more consolidation uh, in the sector. Uh, and of course, you know, unfortunately, uh, the EMP industry, the general energy industry as a percent of say the S and P 500 has declined significantly at one time at the peak, it was literally 16% of the S and P 500 over a decade ago. And now that number is less than 4%. So a significant decline. So you're right. They have to compete for investor dollars. It's also true for ESG issues uh, and other items, they need more scale. And as a result, over time, we do believe there will be consolidation uh, in the industry. So that does mean M&A activity, and it's doing smart transactions that are well thought of uh, by Wall Street. There's no perfect playbook for that in terms of what makes a good transaction, what doesn't. Every deal is quite individual. But overall, we do, again, expect to see consolidation. Uh, we you know, expect that uh, management teams and boards will think about the long-term strategy as they think about consolidation, finding good partners, finding good structures, and also good values and relative values. So um, it's you know, execution and making smart deals. Right. And of course, right now, I guess it's the M and A market's a little slow, right? So you're right at the bottom of the cycle. It's always hard to get it going. The market has been slow. Um, you know, there's really kind of been two markets: one more of an A and D market, an asset value market. That market has really, really dropped off, uh, and, and really, even pre-COVID, uh, the 
at end of last year really started dropping off with a decline in commodity prices and as has stayed low. Uh, the corporate market is continuing to move along. There was a large transaction. Severon announced the uh, merger with Noble, uh, and that was about a $13 billion transaction and, and really the largest since uh, the Anadarko transaction with Oxy about a year ago. So, um, um, you know, we will start to see these uh, happen over time. Uh, there's no doubt uh, a, a price recovery certainly can can help to be bring more m a particularly in the a and d the asset sale market right right add if um, i'm uh, i'm just thinking yes. you know what about cost reduction innovation technology and you know operations improvement are you how do you think of that are you optimistic there's a lot more kind of running room there uh, well, I mean, I, I always believe in technology. I think uh, the, the, the whole industry has got to continue to innovate in that sense. Uh, you know, it was not long ago when we spoke about peak demand, sorry, uh, peak oil. And at that point of time, I think the industry uh, rallied together and then we discovered a number of our new service sources, especially the unconventional pay. And I believe uh, where we are today, um, when it comes to uh, these low oil prices and the environment that we see going forward, most companies have got to be a lot more robust and more resilient. And, well, you can do this in terms of portfolio mix, but I think bottom line, just like Thomas mentioned, I think uh, we have got to open. Yeah? And that means that, you know, whatever new development that you bring in, new greenfield development has got to be able to be uh, sanctioned at a very low set of prices anywhere between 30 to $40. So, so partly through technology and, and, and technical excellence, but partly also picking, of course, the lower cost or unit cost, I guess, projects. Thanks, uh, Adith. Then. I, so I think that's interesting. So we talked a bit about competitiveness. We talked a bit about their consolidation um, portfolios that can be shifted, maybe, maybe some technology as well. I mean, I'm interested then what if you could say turning to the final section you know how do you how does the how do the industry players get the message across to its stakeholders shareholders government owners etc about um, that it's a viable long-term business and what you know i'm interested maybe tim maybe you could comment a bit on what sort of metrics or signposts you think the the investment community are kind of looking for there i think it all gets back to execution and uh, and that really is what drives success. And that starts at the wellhead, good returns on wells, great capital efficiency. That's really what the market's looking for. And then as we go through the income statement, as I mentioned earlier, then it gets all the way down to uh, what is your free cash flow? And then eventually even net income of companies, particularly the larger companies, which uh, Wall Street's looking more and more uh, towards. One thing I would say is that, you know, Wall Street is um, very vigorous and they really, you know, do um, look at the sector uh, very closely. And if the company in the industry is successful and continues to be successful, then Wall Street will come back again towards companies. So, yeah, it's a little bit of a a little bit of a chicken and egg that you think that you need to see some movement, but then it will come back. I think, I think that's what I'm understanding what you're saying. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm interested, um, maybe, um, maybe Adif, how, how would you, how do you kind of present what you're offering going forward to your stakeholders? I mean, what is the, the, the way you phrase the message, you know, and how, how you can provide that confidence? How, how would you do that? Well, I mean, again, it's all about having a set of portfolio that's robust and resilient, having the ability to look at resource development that we can bring to uh, the market at a very low cost. And uh, most importantly, I think in this day and age, I think we've got to do it in the lowest uh, carbon footprint as we can. And uh, 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 the reality is, I think, uh, going forward, I think uh, all I guess 
uh, producers will have got to address this uh, carbon uh, footprint issues. And a number of companies have already made some big bold statements about zero net emission and things like that. So uh, companies like Petronas and any other company will not be, uh, uh, will have got to actually get on the same uh, mode. And we will have got to actually look at all those resource development that we, where, where we can, where we have got first and foremost reduce venting, reduce flaring, reduce uh, methane emissions and, uh, and then present in the, in the case that, yes, we are not only providing affordable and com cost competitive sources of energy, but also source of clean energy. It can never be clean as compared to renewable energy, but we will do our best to lower that to a certain extent that it becomes even net zero carbon for that matter. Right. And then that's, that's kind of by the position we have to go forward and uh, present to our stakeholder. I still hope, I still believe that there is a space, an ample space for uh, all sources of energy in the, in the world's energy, primary energy mix. Continue, the world will continue to, uh, to grow in terms of population, in terms of affluence. I mean, the electricity demand will increase and then you will have got to generate that from multiple sources of energy. And with that, there will be a, a space for oil and most importantly for gas. And I think gas is very well positioned uh, to be the most cost-effective fossil fuels and the clearest of all the fossil fuels. And we need to make sure that we present this towards the order. That that's what the future is. Yeah, yeah. So is there one thing in that message you think that's very different to what it might have been, you know, five years ago? Yeah, well, five years ago, I think the emphasis on carbon may be not that great. I mean, uh, basically, uh, there may be perhaps the, 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 the switch more towards gas may be not that great as what it is today. And uh, I think as we, where we are today with the, with the world that's been affected by COVID-19, with the, uh, you know, the progress made by the renewables, the space for oil may be not be that much as it was before. Uh, with, the chain, with the, all these uh, uh, what call this advancements in the mobility sector, uh, the, the advancement in terms of uh, you know, many, many countries are already moving, switching to EVs and, and all sorts of uh, alternative use of uh, uh, alternative type of vehicles other than uh, internal combustion engine. And because of that, I think there's a lot more of emphasis towards uh, 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 you know, a cleaner form of uh, fossil fuel, which is to me, right. I guess. And, 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 and there's a lot more push now that you see going yeah. forward. Yeah, so again, that, that shift to gas that you've, uh, you've talked about. And, and, and Thomas, I mean, how would you summarize how you can put your case, if I could put it that way, to your stakeholders? How, and, and also, for the same for you, what's really changed in the last few years? I guess that uh, our problem as industry now is maintaining the attractivity of the investment community in this sector. I guess Tim gave some data before that are quite relevant. And... Obviously, we need to consider two factors uh, that uh, have changed drastically recently. First, that the performance of our sector in the last 10 years has, could be better, let's say. Um, second, that the energy transition is not here. Uh, it was a kind of view years ago, but now it's, it's a reality. We are experiencing that uh, overall here in Europe, okay? So with that in mind, uh, I guess uh, the companies now, they need to focus in in terms of being having the adequate financial and ESG ratio. I mean, we need to make all the efforts to adapt to the requirements of the society to retain the license to operate. Emission reduction should be in our business. It was not in our business years ago. Now, I mean, everybody has to put uh, in their numbers uh, how, what emissions do we, ha we have and how we are going to reduce those emissions. The break-evens, remember, we are an industry that we are more focusing promising future and putting less attention to the short-term cash flow. Uh, we are professionals about uh, the expected net present value, but uh, now we have to balance between the expected net present value and the, um, let's say, actual or today's cash flow. Uh, again, thing uh, that is very related to the financial community knows very well about that. Obviously, also the companies have to pay the, the adequate dividends. In the past, you can, you can maintain a long period of time just promising future and even not paying dividends. Now, if you don't pay the dividends, you are out of business. That's a reality.
also these days uh, always having the adequate uh, diversified portfolio is, is, is a must okay and, and still I, I strongly believe that uh, I wouldn't put uh, as I say before all the eggs in the same basket and now more than ever uh, you need to count on people more than ever because uh, we are not very attractive for the young people and uh, having in your organization people which demonstrates experience on delivering is, is also essential, okay? You can promise, but if you don't have that, I'm, I'm thinking of me I'm wrong because you are very related to the, the community and you have a, a very good vision about that. Uh, you cannot promise if you don't have something solid demonstrating that you deliver in the past. So with that in mind, I guess in, in the near future, uh, our sector should deliver value and even in a low price scenario, because as Adip mentioned, break even and low break even between below $40 will be essential for the sustainability of the sector, knowing that the energy transition is coming, knowing the society is pressuring on us more and more than ever, and understanding that our track record is not as good as, good as other industries. Thanks, Thomas. You bring out some interesting points there, especially around the attracting people, of course, the stakeholder group that the industry have to uh, work with includes the young, you know, the new, the new staff coming through as well. I think we've, uh, we've taken on a big task, you know, in half an hour to figure out um, what the answer is to, to uh, position the upstream industry. And I'm, I'm sure we've got many of the answers, but it's going to be an ongoing dialogue. As we all know, it, it doesn't, uh, it never closes. So I'd like to, um, to close out that com the conversation for today. Thank you to the panelists for joining. Very interesting um, discussion. And thank you to all uh, for, for listening to um, uh, Siri Conversations presented by IHS Market and see you, see you again soon.